Good morning, everyone. We're going to give everybody just a few minutes to enter into the webinar and then we will get started. And uh, the YouTube is live as well. Awesome. Okay, with that, good morning. My name is Natalyn DeLapp. I am the Operations Director for the Humboldt County Growers Alliance. HCGA is the trade association representing licensed cannabis businesses within Humboldt County. And we are pleased to bring you a week's worth of education at our Cannabis Genetics and Bioethics Conference hosted this week and produced in partnership with Hendricks Farms. Thank you, Daniel Hendricks here. Every day this week at 11 a.m., we are bringing different tools. Our, we are pleased to bring you a... What's that? Are we still good? Yep. <laughs> Every day this week at 11 a.m., we are bringing different tools of the trade. On Monday, we discussed micro farming. On Tuesday, it was viruses, viroids, and pathology. Today, we are bringing tissue culture and meristematic restoration with Jeremy Warren of Dark Heart Knot Nursery. On Thursday, we are talking about gene editing for yield and stress tolerance. And on Friday, genetic storage for common access. And then a quick reminder, at one o'clock on Friday, we are bringing our headline event, which is the Cannabis Breeders' Rights and Bioethics Panel. We are bringing Matt Pennington from Humboldt Seed Company, Jerry Whitting of LeBlanc CNE, Jesse Dodd from BioVortex, Sunshine Johnson of Sunbolt Grown, Eleanor Kunst of LeafWorks DNA, and this panel is going to be moderated by Colleen Byers. During this panel, they are going to be discussing and debating the practices and technologies, applications that we are bringing to you this week and that are available to cannabis breeders and small farmers. Uh, just a quick reminder that for people to register for each of these events independently, go to hcga.co backslash cannabis genetics and bioethics conference. And uh, with that, I'm gonna introduce my colleague, Heather Luther, who is going to talk about how we are able to bring to you this free programming. Thanks, Natalyn. Good morning, everyone. So. HCGA works on behalf of our licensed cannabis business members, but we also recognize that for the whole industry to thrive, it takes a lot of different businesses, including ancillary businesses. So we have an allied industry business program that connects those ancillary businesses with our licensed cannabis business members. And so all these webinars are brought to you for free because of these generous sponsors. So I'd like to thank Tag Risk Insurance, Rocky Mountain Cannabis Consulting, Rad Source Technology, and the HCBDC, um, which is the Humboldt County Business Development Center through a Headwaters grant. And today's sponsor is Volks Amendments. I'm actually gonna share my screen here for a second and show you guys a fun little time-lapse video of some veggies that were grown for, grown with Volks. And while that's going, I'll tell you a little about Volks. So here we go. I love time lapses. It's really cool to see. So as you can see, these are some super healthy looking veggies. And what Volks is, is a special mixture of isolated volcanic deposits that have been sourced, mixed, and refined by a master German chemist with proven ability to greatly enhance availability and uptake efficiency of water and nutrients. So basically that means that you can save money on both nutrients and save water by using Volks. The great thing about it is it only requires a one-time application. Um, so it doesn't degrade over time so it'll keep giving, showing a return over many harvests and seasons and the lifetime of your crops. Um, it also, you know, in these times of drought gives you water savings because there's more retention efficiency and higher availability. So you use less water. So that's reduced overhead and labor costs. And here's how it applies to cannabis. So, so check this out. These are some case studies. And uh, Bo is Bo's the owner of this company. So if you want to get in touch with Bo, you can just email him at bo 
at getvolks.com. That's B-E-A-U at G-E-T-V-U-L-X.com. Or you can go to getvolks.com and check it out. I'm actually using some volks in my garden, my veggie garden this year. Um, and I'm going to do some of my own side-by-sides. But if you check out their website, you can see some of the side-by-sides. And it's really impressive. It definitely works. So thanks to Volks for being an allied business member with HCGA and supporting this webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. And uh, yeah, I just want to reinforce the importance of all of these organizations and companies that come together to bring this type of programming to our industry, both in Humboldt and across the state of California. So thank you, everyone. And with that, I'd like to introduce Daniel Hendricks from Hendricks Farm. Um, Daniel's been our partner in producing these, uh, all these education programming this week. And I'd like to uh, have him kick it over and uh, get us started. Thank you everyone for joining. Yeah, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, I'm Daniel Hendricks. I'm one of four founders of Hendricks Farms and we're a clone nursery. So we uh, have a lot of similarities with the presenters, Darkheart. And um, basically last summer we spent the summer touring, going to all these different science uh, conferences and just wanted to bring kind of the most exciting technology together uh, that could help people with their genetics and genetic storage. And, um, you know, what the work that um, Jeremy and Max do, I met them uh, first in Pasadena and then we got to go and tour their work at their tissue culture lab uh, in Oakland and you know there's not it's nice when there's actually things that presented in cannabis that are solution based and uh, hopeful and really like the opposite of of what we've been through which is introducing a lot of new you know concepts and a lot of new things that create struggle so the work that they're doing has a really positive result, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Jeremy Warren, who, who has a presentation for us on, on the work that they do. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Hendricks Farms and the, the Humboldt County Growers Alliance for letting me speak for the conference today. Um, we also have on the line here Max Vitarelli, who's our tissue culture uh, manager and he's got a lot of experience in the space so it hits the question time he can probably answer some of the questions better than I can um, so I'll go ahead and get started with the presentation Let's see. all right uh, maybe just give me a thumbs up if you can see the screen here awesome all right, so when we talk about tissue culture and meristematic restoration, uh, it's kind of a hot topic in cannabis. And I think generally speaking, um, a lot of people don't know the history or even what it takes to do tissue culture and what it's best used for in traditional ag as well as, as cannabis. So tissue culture just by itself is growing plant or animal cells in the lab. So uh, it's as simple as that. But you know, it's a somewhat recent uh, discovery. The, this guy named Gottlieb Haberland, um, he was Austrian, I believe. And he first came up with the idea that, um, in, his, in his words, theoretically all plant cells are able to give rise to a complete plant. And that, that term was later called totipotency. And it's kind of a scientific word. And what does totipotency mean? And so totipotency basically means that any cell in a plant can be isolated and turned into an exact copy of that same plant. Um, unfortunately, you know, people, uh, we are not totipotent. So if we try to cut us up into cells and grow new people out of us, we just end up with a dead person. But lucky for us, especially in cannabis, plants, if you do that with, you can not only generate, regenerate one new plant, you can regenerate hundreds of exact copies of that same plant. Um, people are trying to work on it so we can get more people, but it's it's super complicated, and I would guess we're many many years away from, from making clones of, of people using using this sort of technology. Um, so back when the Austrian guy was thinking about this, he could never do it himself. Um, this is true in a lot of sciences. You know, there's a lot of steps that need to happen before the idea, you know, this great idea can actually be proven, and this is one of them. So Frederick Campion Steward. He was the first person to show 
that, and he used carrots, that you could take a single cell of a carrot and regenerate a whole new carrot plant from it. And so this was the actual beginning of plant tissue culture. There had been some work done in between these two guys, mostly around growing plants in the lab. Um, and uh, well, we'll talk about that later when we talk about some of the growth media. But he's the first person that's credited with actually showing that you can take a plant, put it in the lab, just a few cells and make an entire new plant from it. And this, this first image on top, I believe is the image from his first paper. And it's pretty much the same sort of system we do in tissue culture now. So he took a carrot, sliced it in half, two, milli, uh, two milligram fragments, and he kind of grew this in some culture. And then in this culture liquid, the cells actually started to divide and grow. And they were able to get uh, an embryonic plant developed from this root tissue. And they put that in some other media and they were able to grow both shoots and roots from it. And then later on, an entire carrot. And so this, this was basically the seminal research that was done to show that you can take you know, any part of a plant and make an entire new plant from it. It's, it's super cool technology. And since that point, tissue culture has been a useful tool in agriculture ever since. Um, generally in, in ag, tissue culture is used for a number of different reasons. Oftentimes, like the, the big story for tissue culture is banana. Um, banana seeds don't really sprout. You can't make, you can't put a banana in the ground and grow. At least the ones that we're familiar with here, the Cavendish, the big yellow banana. You can't like plant one of the bananas in the ground and hope it, for it to grow a banana tree. And so the way they do bananas is through tissue culture, right? So they basically all those bananas are all copies of each other. Uh, almost all of them are produced through tissue culture starts. And as a result, obviously, they're all very uh, similarly, you know, not resistant to certain pathogens like fusarium. So they do have problems uh, when making clonal varieties that, you know, sometimes you can pick ones that are... Uh, good for you know consumer traits nice big juicy bananas or you can pick them to be resistant sometimes you get both sometimes you don't uh, especially if a new pathogen comes in they can also be used for they're also very often used for um, production of plants that are hard to grow from seeds this is also includes orchids and so orchid tissue culture is is probably one of the, the the major ways orchids are, are produced throughout the world. So when you go and buy the, the orchids in the store, those are also produced from tissue culture. And then, you know, rare exotic rainforest plants, these are all um, done through tissue culture because finding the way and the right, you know, environmental conditions to, to have the seeds germinate and grow is, is often tough. The, I think, you know, one of the, uh, one of the big uses in traditional ag is for developing pathogen-free plant lines. And so tissue culture is very useful for that. And um, I would also like to point out that, you know, to, to go on that point that, you know, plant cells are totipotent or they're able to, you know, make, generate an entire plant from one cell. They've done leaf tissue, bud tissue, roots, embryo, callus, this whole big list here. So they've, they've put this into media with, you know, uh, hormones and they've been able to regenerate plants from all of these tissues. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. And it's, there's a lot of uses here for this on the scientific side and I won't get too in depth for each of these, but it's, it, it just shows that um, plants are very robust and especially in the tissue culture setting. And so this would be a typical, you know, when people talk about tissue culture, they often talk about micropropagation, right? So it just means scale of propagation is small, so it takes up a smaller footprint um, rather than, you know, a large nursery. You can grow a lot of plants hypothetically in a very small uh, space. Obviously, the costs of producing the plants go up in this case, but for certain crops, it does make sense to do it this way. And so the general workflow, and, you know, there's, there's four stages when we talk about micropropagation. Initiation stage, multiplication stage, breed stage, and then acclimatization. So in all cases, you start with a mother plant. In this case, we have a nice cannabis plant here. We'd like to either, you know, make a bunch of clones of this plant or maybe clean some pathogens out of it. And for, for cannabis, the, the two most common things you'll do is mare stem tissue culture or node, nodal tissue culture. And I'll talk about that a little more in depth. Um, down the line, this is the initiation. We take those actual tissues and put them into the tubes. 
then over time shoots will develop and those shoots and leaves will then make more shoots and leaves and you can you know propagate from those take those new shoots put them back into some media and so this sort of loop right here can be you know feedback like we're always making shoots we're always making uh, leaves that we can then plop back into the media and you can multiply from one you can make you know hundreds just by doing this over and over and over again and they're all exact copies of the original plant when you're ready to export those to grow into new plants you know you can you can use some some plants need uh, hormones to grow roots others will root just fine in in the media and so the root stage make them grow roots and then you put them into the acclimatization so all that means is like you know this environment in this tube it's super nice and humid there's lots of nutrients and water you're going to put it into soil the air is going to be you know less humid and so you kind of got to be careful when you're putting them in the soil so that you take care of them because they're very very easily dry out once you move them from this you know, water rich nutrient environment straight into soil so it takes a little time to get them used to soil growing but once they start then you can just pot them up and they'll grow just like a normal plant and so the, you know, this sort of process in big ag has been, you know, I think the, the biggest use and the most, you know, you know, bang for your buck that ag found out is that, hey, you know, there's a lot of viruses, viroids, fungi, bacteria that cause yield losses in, in all of our ag crops. And so, you know, this, this you know, Meristem tissue culture technology is, is very well versed to taking, um, pathogens out of plants through this process. And I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit more, but I think the, the main takeaway here is though, is that traditionally this work has been done by universities and government organizations. You know, UC Davis, they have the foundation plant services and they do grapes, roses, strawberries. You know, hops are very closely related to cannabis. And I think up in uh, Washington or Oregon, they have the, the hops National Clean Plant Network through the USDA, a government agency. And so, you know, growers and breeders can just buy pathogen free material from these these service providers. But unfortunately, you know, cannabis has been a scheduled drug for so long, doesn't have any sort of background uh, clean plant programs that could be used by growers or breeders. And so really, a lot of this work needs to be taken on by the actual growers and breeders themselves. And you know, we're kind of starting fresh here. And so there's, there's a lot and if you watch the, you know, the talk yesterday there's a lot of new pathogens that are being discovered you know every every few months there's a new one in, in cannabis and i think you know in order to clean these plants you have to know what's in them and so there's a little bit of lag time happening here while we discover what plants you know what pathogens are affecting cannabis and then figure out ways to get them out of the plants and so we'll talk about tissue culture you know in a, in a cannabis specific way here and i think I'd like to keep it very high level. Um, I think a lot of people probably have never been inside a cannabis tissue culture lab. So, you know, it, it's sort of amorphous. You don't really know what's going on inside. It's, uh, and so I'll take a few slides here to kind of explain to everybody what happens in our cannabis tissue culture lab, what, what sorts of materials we use and, and what we're doing in there on a daily basis. And so if you look here, yeah, it's basically just plants growing in some media and some tubs or test tubes. Um, all of these things are obviously sterilized. And the most important thing, you know, when working with tissue cultures, you got to keep, um, you got to keep everything very sterile. You need to, uh, sorry, I got a question. I'll answer the questions at the end, but yeah, please feel free to, to, to chime in along the way and we'll get to them all at once. The, you know, the media we use for these plants can grow a lot of things. It can grow bacteria, it can grow fungi. So if you're not working in a sterile environment, even those things in the air and the spores will land on that media and it'll contaminate all of your plants. And so that's, that's kind of a big bummer, especially with the long timelines that tissue culture um, takes. And so if you're setting up a lab, and a lot of the stuff you can kind of do in a garage, but you kind of need a sterile space to work, right? So I would suggest sterile hoods, you know, you can get them not super expensive or just have like a really nice area you can work in and then you just need a way to sterilize your tools keep your work area clean 
and you need to be able to a way to make the media. Some people, you know, these these uh, homegrown tissue culture guys will just use pressure cookers to cook the media, right? We, we use an autoclave because we can do more at once and it provides a little more utility. But the, these hoods for us are kind of the bread and butter. They're very, very stable, sterile work environment. Um, there's lots of space to do transfers. And Here's an example here. Right? So we're in the sterile. There's air here. There's a HEPA filter in the back. It keeps the air free of any fungi or bacteria that can land on these plants and then also contaminate our strains. And so it looks like they're doing a transfer here inside the hood. So they're taking some material that have been growing, cutting off new shoots and placing them in a fresh tube of auger media to grow again. So this is part of the, the you know, multiplication stage at this point. He's got gloves on all the tools are sterilized between plants to prevent pathogens from going back and forth. This is another example of some of the equipment we use. These are uh, basically just test tubes. Um, this is what we usually do most of our meristem tissue culture in. Another sterile environment, lets some air in so the plants can breathe, um, but keeps all the fungi and the bacteria out. These are some nice, happy, happy plants. It's kind of actually hard to take pictures of uh, tissue culture plants within a vessel because the, the lighting is really bad. But uh, you know, when you when you start growing, getting them in there and they start growing, it's 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 really kind of cool. And if you haven't, you know, been able to see a tissue culture facility, we often do uh, tissue culture um, facility visits and tours for growers uh, from California. So. If, if you want to check one out in real life, you can come to our facility and check out what we're doing. We're more than welcome to, to, to show you. And so, you know, every, you know, you have the tissue culture hoods and the autoclaves and all the, the science equipment to make the media, but you also need a nice, you know, sterile, clean space to keep all of them, right? And so for us, we keep a lot of our strains in what we call genetic storage. And so a lot of these strains are not actively in production at the nursery, but we want to keep the genetics and preserve them you know, for our breeding program, but then also, you know, occasionally growers will ask us, hey, we, you guys used to, you know, produce this killer strain, you know, five, 10 years ago, do you guys still have it? And it's likely that we have it in culture and just bring it back out into the nursery and, and uh, start producing again. And then, you know, when a lot of companies will do, uh, you know, tissue culture as a production method. And so at Dark Heart, I think we, we find the value of the tissue culture really is in part of the clean plant program. But there, there are companies out there that can use it as a production platform. And, and the way they do that is mostly through bioreactors. You know, without, without these, and what you're looking at here is just a liquid-based media you know, system. If you look at these other pictures, we have a nice solid auger-based system for, for the traditional tissue culture. But here, nutrients are constantly getting, you know, cycled through these bioreactors. And you can see in the back here, there's some media down here with some plants growing. So this, this increases the, the growth rate of the, the plants and tissue culture, it lets you get more plants, you know, per initiation. The drawback here is these can, if you know, if you're not careful, these can be very prone to contamination from fungi and bacteria. And then what happens is you lose a whole reactor and you lose a ton of plants. So it's, it's, it's a little more, it takes a little more finesse and uh, it, it takes a little practice to get the bioreactors up and running. It also helps to have a great team. Uh, Max is also on the call. We just uh, at the end for some questions. I'm sure there's a lot of questions. I kept at high level so that at the end we can sort of sit down if you have specific questions to go over we can we can definitely talk about them at the end and so we'll take a little dive deeper into the cannabis tissue culture and, and the, the, the two methods that are that are used most and so when you you know I'm sure a lot of you growers have talked to different companies about tissue culture and, and what it means and, and what do I get and so the two most common are nodal tissue culture and meristem tissue culture or meristematic some people call it shoot tip tissue culture. I think I think the best terminology is this meristem because then you then you don't confuse the times. They both start with the same starting material. You got a plant, right? The plant has shoots, it's got nodes, it's got leaves, it's, it's an entire plant. For nodal, what you do is you just take, so you can see over here we've cut them off, right? So you get some growing nodes and some stem tissue 
right? And this will be the starting material for uh, our nodal tissue culture. Th this is the starting tissue, you know, starting material for almost every nodal tissue culture, you know, whether it's for grapes, strawberries, or any sort of crop. This is what they mean when they mean nodal. And cutting nodes off a plant to use in tissue culture. The other one, which is a little more, you know, in depth and take some skills, what they call marrow stem tissue culture. Still with the same plants, except now you're just growing the very tiniest growing shoot tip. Okay, and you put that under a microscope. Uh, what it looks like is this, kind of looks very alien y, right? And so what's happening here is this is the, the very first growing part of the of the plant, the marrow stem, right? This is all the tissue that'll get differentiated into leaves and stems, vascular tissue along the way. And the cool thing about this is if you look at this picture, it's a little tough to tell, but right here on this line is where the vascular tissue stops, right? So this isn't connected to the vascular tissue. That means if there's bacteria or fungi or virus that are stuck here in the phloem or xylem, it's really hard for them to get into these cells. Um, some viruses that aren't as limited to the vascular tissue can be up here and some viroids can be up here anyway, but it's, it's it's their best chance to get away from those is this rapidly differentiating tissue. And what you want to do is you want to cut it off just so you get this part, right? The, the, the fewer, the, the smallest piece of marriage stem you can get, the better. You know, if you start getting too big of a piece, you start getting down in here into the vascular tissue, you're going to bring fungi and bacteria along <laughs> with your piece. And so it does take a fair bit of finesse. Um, take someone who's got a lot of practice, you know, uncovering all the leaves. If you can see around here, these are the start of the leaves, young leaves. And there's, a, there's like a, if you think of like an artichoke, right? There's a bunch of leaf scales around here that are blocking this. So you actually got to kind of dissect this away to see it. What you do is you take this node and you stick it in the media, right? And then this is specialized me media. I'll talk about it a little later. But what it allows it to do is it allows the plant to get nutrients and it'll allow the tops to grow. And so if you can look over here in four to six weeks, they've gone from this stumpy, you know, basically trunk into, you know, a leafed out plant. And what I will say is, you know, at this stage, these, these nodes can be surface sterilized, right? So if there's any surface fungi on there, like powdery mildew, botrytis, that'll all get eliminated when you basically bleach these guys. And you, you can bleach them for quite some time and still have them be viable. So you can pretty much get rid of all the surface contaminates with these guys. And, and the same here on the, on the marrow stem. And so, you know, a, no, a typical nodal timeline for tissue culture is in the three or six months. Um, you know, what, once they get out to this stage on the far right, they're ready to be transferred and multiplied again into additional plants. So it depends like, you know, if, and it's best to take these guys off and to put them into media again and then root those guys because you have a little better success and like you know we talk about resetting genetics but um, a lot of things go into that and we'll talk about that in a second as well. And the other one sort of looks like this it's the meristem timeline so this little green dot is a meristem that's been growing for over a month four to six weeks you know and, and when you I, I started here because when you when you put it on <laughs> the this auger, you can barely see it with your naked eye, right? It's maybe a fleck of the tiniest sand you've seen. And it takes that little fleck of cells, you know, maybe there's just a, 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 a you know, a handful of cells in that mirror stem, you know, it takes them a month and a half to get to a size where you can see above, you know, this little green dot. And then slowly over time, that plant will turn into a whole nother plant, right? It's, it's, it's super exciting, cool. And then, you know, you can, with mirror stem, oftentimes you want to add hormones into it to help you know, promote shoot growth since it's just a big mass of undifferentiated cells at this point. And then once the, the, the plant is big enough, then you can change the media to have more hormones that'll grow roots. And so this, this whole process takes a long time, but as you'll see, it's very, this process with the meristem is very good at limiting pathogens uh, with, with some help. And so I was like, what's the benefits of tissue culture, like why, why nodal, why meristem, like what's the difference, why do I care, why does one take like nine to 12 months and one takes three to six months. Um, obviously, you know, the, the, the time difference is because when you're starting here with something you can't see and getting a whole plant, that takes a long time. 
And so once you get to this stage, this basically comes hop over back over here the nodal, and you got to start multiplying it out. So then you can output you know 10 to 20 plants from that initial thing. So that just takes a lot of time. Nodal's a little faster. And so like what's the difference in what you get out of it? And so I think you know nodal tissue culture can eliminate some pathogens. It's not as good at viruses uh, and viroids for sure. You're probably not going to eliminate any uh, using nodal tissue culture. You can eliminate surface pathogens definitely, but try this, uh, you know, powdery mildew, things like that. And if you add some antibiotics, if you if you think you have a fungi or bacteria in there, that's your worrisome. In some cases, you can add antibiotics or, or fungicides to get rid of them. It's not as good as Meristem for doing that, but it's it's possible. But I think you know both of these technologies are really good at what we call you know resetting genetics. And to be honest, when I when I first started at the the lab, you know. As a scientist, I was very sort of unsure about how much, you know, just starting from a, a little node can, can reset the genetics, like scientifically speaking, like what is happening here. And I, I don't think we have a good understanding of why it happens, but we definitely do see, you know, increased plant vigor, increased plant yields, even after just doing the nodal tissue culture. So there's, there is something going on there, I think, scientifically, I think, or to be done, especially on the nodal to, to understand. Maybe it's DNA methylation. Maybe there's something else going on that's going to reset that does, you know, provide this benefit. But um, we, we've seen it in our in our garden. We've seen it with other growers who've done the process for nodal tissue culture, you know, growing these plants that came through here next to plants that haven't been there. And you see a noticeable difference, whether that's pathogens, whether it's DNA methylation. Again, I'm, I don't think we have enough information to say for sure. And then the meristem side, you know, you can eliminate pathogens, but this is way better, right? You're pretty much going to eliminate all the, any bacteria or fungi that can live in the vasculature of the, of the plant. And a lot of these, you know, it, it, you know, and then also you can eliminate virus and viroids. Now you can't always eliminate virus and virus just with meristem tissue culture. Sometimes you need to do some other steps and, and we'll talk about that as well. In, in a little bit. And the, you know, the, the nice thing about both of these is you really have a small production footprint. And so, you know, I think in, in the short term where, you know, there's not a lot of stable seed and, and things that can go through, you can, you can probably do some pretty good work with a small footprint producing tissue culture plants in the cannabis space. I, th I think, I think, you know, as, as the stable seed comes online, I think you're gonna, it's gonna, we'll, we'll see what happens down the line. I, th I think, uh, you know, the big ag model is, you know, they use this sort of thing as part of a clean plant program. And then, you know, the stable seeds and stuff they breed from it is what they, they sell to people. So we'll see if uh, this sort of the same, you know, pattern holds true in cannabis. And this is the media, you know, when I talked originally for the first guy in 1902 who thought about plants being able to be made and the guy in 1958 uh, who who showed that it was possible. There had been a lot of work done and uh, Mershiga and Skoog, they, uh, they did a lot of work on just straight growing plants in tissue culture. And this is one of the media that they developed. I think this was way back in the 30s or 40s actually. And it's still one of the preferred medias that people use for plant tissue culture. There's a couple of them out there. Like different cannabis strains sort of have different nutrient needs and so you know, I think most people try this one first and it works for a lot of them, but if not, then you have to try a couple other things. And it just takes, it takes time. There, there are some nice papers out there that, that talk about different media formulations uh, for cannabis. And I think, you know, some of them are pretty reproducible and some of them are not, but that's, that's generally the case with, with science in any way. And then, you know, if you do a good job and you do some nice, nice metal tissue culture here, I think Max did these himself. Uh, you get some plants that you can multiply from. And then the last step, you know, after you've gone through the process of nodal tissue culture or mare stem, you get to the point where you're like, hey, these guys now have roots. Let's put them in some soil and grow them. As I mentioned before, you know, it's, you want to kind of keep the humidity high in here. They're very delicate, so it takes them a little while to get up and going. But, but once they start rooting there and, and you can transplant them into like a three inch pot in there and they grow very quickly uh, and you get a whole new plant. And so there's always questions like, how do you create disease-free plants with tissue culture? And so we'll, 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 
we'll talk about this in, in relation to hoplite and viroid specifically. You know, each one of these pathogens that you discover that affects a crop, first you need to figure out what the problem is, right? And so, you know, back in 2015 or even before, like people had noticed that there was something going around in people's cannabis grows. They didn't know what it was, but they noticed that it, you know, it could range from, you know, four to 30% infection rate in, in, in the grows, causing, you know, pretty, pretty significant yield losses. And they call this PCIA or putative cannabis infectious agent. So it seemed like it was being able to be transferred between plants. Um, it caused a very obvious like disease phenotype. So people had started looking to figure out like, hey, is this a new disease? It's something that's been found before. Like what is what is causing all these losses? And some of the symptoms people saw were, you know, obviously stunted plants. You know, these, these two plants, same age, same strain. This one's way smaller for the same age. Something's going on. And if you look at the, the morphology of this plant too, like the nodes are really close together. This almost looks like a little Christmas tree. You know, that everything's really close. The leaves are very really spiky. You know, they're not falling over and hanging like a normal plant. They're sticking up. And so there's definitely some, some growth characteristics that are changing in the plants that are infected with this, you know, putative infectious agent. And then some people notice like this lower branching, like it's losing its, its dominance of growth toward the light. These lower branches bow out. They become very brittle. They can snap off just by touching them. But I think the, the biggest symptom people saw, and which really causes the most concern, is you know when these these plants are getting ready to harvest and they're getting ready to flower, you see a huge difference in both yield, like weight of the flowers, terpene, trichome content. Like this, what this is, these are both chem dog, both the same age, two plants right next to each other in the the same greenhouse actually. And so this nice frosty, super healthy looking, you know, plant, lots of great you know smells flavors in it and this smells like alfalfa it's small very grassy and it, you know the price difference between these two these two products is huge and so you know like when, when you start losing you know money at the yield stage that's that's when you've got to be like hey we need to figure out what this is and so you know we did a bunch of genetic sequencing figured out that it was the hop latent viroid that was causing these these symptoms and so once you figure out that um the cause of the disease. And so not only do we figure out the cause, like so what you do in genome sequencing, you just take a plant, grind it up, figure out everything that's in there. And one of the things that popped up was hoplite and viroid. So then we took that hoplite and viroid, infected healthy plants with it, and they also turned into symptomatic disease plants, right? That's that's a very important sort of scientific experiment called Cox postulates, where you, you isolate whatever's causing the pathogen in an unhealthy plant make sure you have it in clean culture and then infect a you know healthy plant with that and if the healthy plant then generates the exact same symptoms and then you can isolate that same pathogen then you know it's not just associated with the plant that's actually causing the disease and so once you know it's causing the disease then you need to make a test so you can tell infected plants from healthy plants and you know the the unfortunate nature of this this viroid is it's latent, so it can kind of hang around plants, and you never expect them to be, you know, infected. They're very asymptomatic; they look healthy, but when you dive down and do a genetic-based test, you can see that it is harboring the viroid. You're like, well, if it looks healthy, why do I care? Uh, it seems to be fine. Is like if you have other strains that are more highly affected, and you're pruning between them, then it's a big problem because now you're unknowingly spreading pathogen from uh, infected plants to healthy plants and you know they've shown in hops which was why it's called hop latent virus is first found in hops you know it didn't seem to be a major um, issue right they don't see any sort of symptoms like this in hops right they don't see stunting all they see is that the second when they go to harvest and they look for like the alpha acids the stuff that makes beer super exciting they notice they're way depressed and so I think even though you see some healthy plants in your grow that may be considered asymptomatic, I think you're going to see that those are also reduced in secondary metabolites compared to a healthy plant. And so what you want to do now is, you know, I don't know if you guys were on the call, conference call yesterday, but they were talking about how once your plant has a virus or a viroid, you can't really do anything other than tissue culture or like meristem excision, you know, to clean the plants from those, those pathogens. And so what you need to do is which plants are positive, which ones are negative. Do a quick stream, you know, 
if you have one strain and it's only positive for the viroid, then you have to go to the next steps and try to clean it up. If you have some negative ones, great, use those. And so the next step is basically what I call plant torture. And so um, the idea, it's sort of like chemotherapy in people with cancer, right? You want to torture the plant enough where you don't kill it, but you also suppress the growth of the pathogen inside it. And so when we talked about that little area of, you know, the apical meristem, right, it's not connected to the vasculature, it's a big plus to keep viruses and viroids out. Two, it's rapidly, you know, multiplying those cells. And so the virus needs to replicate and then move between those new cells. So if you can get a small enough piece, hopefully you've excluded the, the virus and viruses. So you can't do this all the time. And so meristem tissue culture alone isn't necessarily sufficient to ensure the viroid elimination. Um, seems you get uh, carryover, even if you're really careful with the meristem process. So really need to do, and some of the common treatments for plant torture, or <laughs> we call it pre-treatment, is cold, heat, or even like chemicals, right? So anything you can do to keep the plant alive to try to you know, suppress the growth of that, in this case, the virus. And so if you're successful with that, you know, after a month or so of torturing the plants, you can then do the meristem tissue culture, and then um, you should get a clean plant out the other side. And I think, you know, what that looks like in a clean plant program, so this is what it looked like in our nursery. So we get a, it's kind of a, it's kind of a busy slide, but it'll make sense as I walk through it. So you get plants in, you know they're infected with the viroid, but you really like the strain or you want to use it for your breeding program. So take, take those plants, torture them, like I said before, with the pretreatment, and then you harvest and sterilize the apexes and then extract the meristem from them. And you can grow them in a tube or a plate, you know, and this is a long process. And now you've got, you know, six, you know, seven, nine months before you can acclimatize a plant. Luckily, we can test these plants along the way to ensure that we are free from the viroid. And so I talked about developing that test. That's what we use. We use a genetic based test to see if any of those meristems are still positive and we toss them out during the process. So once, once we get to the end, we're, we're pretty certain that we have all viroid free plants. We test them again before they go out to the nursery. Um, usually most of them will test negative. There might be a few that slip through, but then obviously for us, they go into our elite mom foundation block. And so what I will say about the testing is, you know, Initially, we're just testing like one or two times and assuming if it was negative, it was good. And if it's positive, fine, we'll throw it out. But the, uh, the, what we found out is because of the late nature, you actually need to test these plants three or four times to ensure they're negative. And with that amount of testing, um, you can be sure once you hit this stage and you're outputting to the mom block that they are clean. So that was a little bit of a learning curve there. And I think you're like, why three or four times? Why not just once? It's nature, the viroid can be at different concentrations. You know, in this plant you start with, it could be really high over here on this shoot you took for this virus in, but it could be pretty low over here, right? And so by the time it comes over here, you wanna make sure that it's, it's super, super clean. And so then for us, what we do is we put it into our leap mother block they're tested every month to make sure the virus is not there. So then when you make clones and new moms and product to customers, it's, it's, it's free of the viroid. And it's, it's super, super important sanitation and keeping the way this thing is moved through your facility is almost entirely through mechanical means. That means you pruning an infected plant, pinching buds from an infected plant, going to a healthy plant, any way you can transfer sap between the plants, that's how it moves. There's not really any insect vectors for viroids, which is a good thing for help cleaning it out. But the onus is really on, you know, the growers and the people working the facilities to make sure they're sanitizing those pruners in between cuts, bleach or vircon, you know, something, something that's actually going to kill the viroid. And if, if, so this, this is like the first step for a clean plant program, right? This is how you keep, uh, whoops, sorry. This is how you keep, this is how you keep the hoplite viroid on your grow. And so as, as we find each new virus, right, you want to be testing for it before you put it into your grow, right? You want to quarantine, they mentioned this yesterday, a spot where you can do some initial screens for pathogens to keep them out. And as long as you're keeping up on the sanitation, if something new comes in, you might even keep it, keep it out as well. And so as more, as more pathogens get discovered, as more important pathogens 
be discovered, you add these to the clean plant program so that now you have a panel of tests you're doing for every single plant. And you know that the, the plants you're using and providing don't have any unwanted pathogens in them. And unfortunately, the university can't do this. You know, we might see some hemp clean plant programs start coming online with, uh, with the latest farm bill, but it's gonna take them a little bit of time to get up and running and, and who knows when they'll do cannabis specific strains. So in the short term, you know, it's, it's a lot on the industry to really work hard together to keep, keep these pathogens at bay. And then I'll, I'll kind of leave the conversation here in, the, in, the, in a segue into tomorrow's talk, which is, you know, tissue culture has a lot of um, utility in science. And so the, it is used um, for genetic engineering. And so since you can, you know, genetic modification is done to single cells. So what you can do is modify a single cell and grow an entire new plant from those single cells. And so tissue culture is a big player in that space as well. I won't go too into it now, but a lot of the stuff we talked about today are, are techniques that people will use and you'll hear about tomorrow about how to make genetically engineered plants. And I think with that, I'd just like to thank the team. Um, I, they do all the hard work. Um, will is one of the guys who took on a lot of the work around the, the hop latent virus curing and finding the best, you know, treat free treatments to ensure that we're ending up with clean plants. Max, who's also on the call here, he's the tissue culture manager. He's probably got the most uh, tissue culture experience in, in our science team. And then we also have Richard Philbrook. He's, he's uh, really taken on the, the helm of the diagnostics. So developing all our tests for hoplite and virate and other pathogens. And then we have two techs, Jared Peterson and James Fadavi, who do great work uh, keeping up our, our tissue culture programs. And then our, our breeder, Kay Watt, who's also uh, got some exciting experiments going on in tissue culture for, for everybody, everybody's benefit. So with that, I'll wrap it up and we'll, we'll pass it back off to questions and I'll stop sharing for now unless I need to bring back up the screen. Thank you so much, Jeremy. That was wonderful. It was, I'm sure everybody uh, got a lot of really good information from that. That was really in depth. And, Felt like getting the tour, which is really cool. <laughs> and I think you touched on a really important point is that like this nursery space, all of cannabis as a whole, it's a, it's a, it's a partnership um, between everybody. And so keeping your genetics on your farm individually healthy, you know, helps affect the whole community when we share genetics the way we do in cannabis. So um, I, to further introduce Max as well, um, Max, when we got the tour, uh, you know, his lab space to me said surgical and, and Max is a surgeon and to execute that functionality, you know, Mac, Max has a unique set of skills. And so uh, really excited to, to have him answer some of these questions that we have coming up. And so uh, I've, got a, I've got one question here from Tyler. Um, I think we kind of answered it. He said, what is the process of tissue culture that removes the pathogens and viruses? Is it just the sterilization at the first step or is there other steps conducted uh, for the pathogen removal? And, and I think um, you answered that, but do you want to address it again? Just Sure, I mean, um, I think, you know, the, the initial sterilization helps get stuff off the outside of the plants for sure. Mostly your, your foliar pathogens, botrytis, powdery mildew, um, and those types of, you know, some bacteria. The, you know, in order to cure viruses and virids, oftentimes you do have to do those extra steps that I talk about, you know, doing the, the pretreatments with heat, cold, or, you know, chemo type of therapies, you know, for, you know, up to a month or so. <laughs> And then doing the meristem tissue culture, that's what that's where you're really getting the cure. And if you look at a lot of the, you know, the the university or um, governmental clean plant programs, they have, you know, standard, you know, either heat treatment or cold treatments as part of that for every one of the viruses and virons they 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 suggest their cure from in their programs. So yeah, you have to do all the steps. Sometimes meristem can get rid of stuff, but you really want to be sure it's it's definitely doing it worth doing the uh, the full treatment. Max, is there anything you want to add on the, the, the pre-treatment? No, I think you hit everything. Uh, Max, you do both of those? Or do you, do, are, as a tissue culture expert, are, are you working on both the meristematic part as well as the treatment part? 
Yeah, so uh, Will, who Jeremy mentioned earlier, uh, works with the plants um, while they're in quarantine and does all the uh, pre-treatment, so chemo, cold, heat therapy, what have you. Um, and then once they're done with pre-treatment, they come to the lab where we surface sterilize the plants and then dissect the marrow stems. That's awesome. I have a, another question here. This one is from Rebecca. She says, are you guys coming across any cannabis varietals that are resistant to, to hops latent viroid? Yes, this is always the question of the hour. Uh, so far, we haven't really, I mean, obviously more work needs to be done. I can't say this definitively, but we have found hop latent viroid in pr pretty much every strain we've tested. Now, what I will say is there are strains that do much worse when they have hot latent viroid compared to others. So like, Fire, a lot of the OGs seem to be particularly infected by hop latent viroid more than other strains. Um, strawberry, banana, um, blue dream even, like some of these guys just do really bad with it. And so we definitely see that. And we see some that are what you call more asymptomatic. Um, it, they, I don't know if we have a really good understanding of those, but th there are some around which suggest there might be some resistance genes out there that people can look for to help find you know uh, uh resistant plants but i don't think we know for sure that there's a strain that if you infect it with hop latent viral yet that it won't become infected and that's kind of what you need because i think even even the ones that look sort of healthy and can kind of you know provide yield they're still reduced in the secondary metabolites the the terpenes the thc and the cannabinoids and so i think you know Obviously, we're very interested in those trials as part of a reading program to try to find something that maybe you can infect it all you want with a uh, hop latent virus and not get it. That would be the idea, but we don't know of any strain yet. Yeah, in our general experience as well, I've seen what I'd say, you know, some that are more affected uh, by the hops latent viroid and some that are less effective and non-symptomatic plants, um, you know, that might contain the virus and it is interesting or viroid because it's interesting in the, how it compares to um, just what's going on today with the coronavirus testing that there are kind of these silent carriers that, that you know, can cause damage in other parts of your farm or crop, so. Yeah, that's a good point. I think, you know, the, the first step is always roguing out those uh, infected plants and you can do a pretty good job once you kind of see the symptoms, but there's still, you know, you, Originally, people thought, well, I rogued out the infected ones. It's not going to be a problem anymore. And then like a year later, it's everything's back. And so that's a good first step. It'll probably bring you down 10 or 20. Like most farms that we talk with are between like 20 and 50% infected in their mother stock. So you might get 10 to 20% reduction just by symptoms, but you really need to do some sort of testing in your mother block to ensure you get rid of it. It is, and it's a costly you know time consuming endeavor but it, you know we've worked with a lot of growers that it really works for and they 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 noticed a big difference at the yield time right and so i think you know but you got to get buy-in from the whole team otherwise it's not worth trying <laughs> you got to make sure everybody's doing the proper sanitation following through and you will see differences on your yield for sure i have a question here from wendy and she says, uh, so if you have your plants that have HPLVD and you plant them in the field in your farm and next year you go to harvest, when you go back to replant the following season, you know, are they going to succumb to HPLVD through what might be in the root system that's left in the soil? Yeah, so this, this is probably a, a very low incidence. So, um, you know, hop latent virus can be in the roots. Um, it can live there at pretty high concentrations. The, the, you know, the, I would suggest that this isn't like fusarium where if you have hop latent viroid plants growing in a field that it's gonna just build up with viroid over and over again, right? The viroid needs the cells to live and it needs, you know, actively dividing cells to live. And, you know, if it's by itself on like surfaces or soil, it doesn't last more than like a month, okay? Um, now, so generally speaking, you're not going to have that issue of having planted viroid infected plants before and then coming back in with clean ones and you know, get infected. There are a couple like minor ways this could happen. Let's say you got a couple rogue plants that are growing as weeds or you have some root tissue that's sort of stayed intact. You know, it could still have some viroid in there, but it still needs to get in through a wound, right? The viroid just can't attack the roots by itself. 
that needs to come into a wound of some sort. That's why mechanical transmission is so high. And so I think on the scale of things, you know, you would probably be very minuscule in the transmission from one season to the next, probably zero. I, I would guess that there's not a lot of chance of that happening. I have a question from Tyler. Tyler wants to clarify, he says, uh, can hops latent viroids spread through direct touch of leaf to leaf uh, from, from two plants? Yes. So hypothetically, yes. Um, I think, you know, anytime that you have, but it has to be two wounds. So like if you get one infected plant that's got broken from plants rubbing against each other and then it oozes into a healthy plant, it can become infected. Um, I think, you know, epidemiologically like what we see in grows is that's a, probably a pretty low occurrence and so what we see is when people tighten up their sanitation they're always sterilizing their tools after cutting each plant that almost like 99 percent of the spread is through mechanical means and so that there while there may be a tiny amount of leaf to leaf on rubbing plants that it's if you take care of the sanitation you test to get the plants out that the rate of that happening is, is way too low to to make it come back from the other stuff you're doing. So it's, it's what, you know, if you can space them out, great. If you can't, we don't see it as a major, uh, you know, avenue of spread. What if they're sharing like the same water reservoir uh, from like a hydroponic system? Yeah, they can, the, the virus can live in the recirculated water for a while, like a month. Um, a lot of people have treatments in place. So like, you know, UV treatment, ozone, those sorts of things should sort of break up the molecules. Um, the one thing is, again, it has to get in through a wound, right? So even if you water it with viral infected, you know, water, it, there's got to be a wound on the root for it to get into. It can't infect it by itself. So either, you know, maybe there's some root aphids feasting down there and you got some infected water and it comes in, maybe, right? But again, I think the the, the highest rate of success is your pretty mechanical means. So sanitation, sanitation, that'll get you through it fastest. Gotcha. Okay, I have a, a question from Andelaine. Um, they have uh, some prized genetics that have been passed down um, through their family and they can't get their seeds to crack. Um, can tissue culture help um, germinating old seeds? Yeah, definitely can. Well, Max take this one because they do it in the lab. Yeah, so if you have seeds that um, aren't viable or you're not able to pop them through traditional means, we can uh, do what's called embryo rescue through tissue culture. Uh, so we uh, quickly, we take the seed, uh, soak it in water, uh, surface sterilize it, crack it open, and we take the, we dissect the embryo from the seed itself and put it onto a nutrient solution uh, to grow. Um, sometimes we introduce a little bit of hormones to, to kind of tell the plant how to grow because uh, we do remove, the, uh, remove it from its nutrient source inside the seed during that process. But yeah, uh, it's definitely possible, um, especially in um, if, if they're relatively new seeds that just for some reason aren't viable through traditional propagation. Uh, we can we can do that. Um, there's we've also done some work with old seeds that are they've just been in storage for a long time um, and they, and they don't pop through traditional means. So we can put those into tissue culture as well uh, to get plants back. That was a that was a great question, by the way. Really glad you asked that question. Um, are there opportunities through dark heart or through other uh, producers that if a somebody has a phenotype that they've isolated and they want to reinvigorate it uh, to clean it up, is that something that Dark Heart uh, can do or other nurseries? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, we, we, we provide our, our tissue culture program, you know, specifically for like clean pro plant program types of events, either to rejuvenate genetics or to cure plants of specifically hop latent viroid. That's the one, you know, sort of clean plant program, you know, pathogen cleansing you know, uh, service we do provide. So if you're a licensed grower in California, we can take the plants in and, and put them, Max can put them through, uh, or Will and Max can put them through torture and then get a clean plant out the other side. You just gotta shoot us an email. Uh, we can definitely talk about what you're seeing. Uh, sometimes it's easier just to find a clean strain, but if you don't have one, we can definitely help you clean up the important one you do. 
Oh, Dan, you're muted there. There we go. Um, I just wanted to make sure everybody knew, knows it's noon now, so we can keep fielding questions if Jeremy and Max are into that. And I uh, just wanted to make sure everybody knew, knew what time it was. So. Yeah, we um, stick around a bit. Awesome. Yeah, just let us know if you guys got other stuff to go to. We can, we can break off it at any point. Um, Becky would like to know, uh, what is the best used for sanitation? Is it like bleach or alcohol? What, what, should, what are her best practices? Yeah, talking about the virus specifically for sanitation. Um, no, we, we went back and we did some good literature searches around virus in general, what types of, of you know, sanitation products work the best. And it seems like you know, the, the two that stand out are the Vercon, I think it's called Vercon S now, and then the uh, basically household bleach. Um, you can also use powdered milk. It seems to work pretty well. That's lactic acid, I would assume, is the active agent there, but it doesn't do as well against other pathogens like fungi and bacteria. So if you're, if you're choosing some for the viroid, you wanna make sure it's active versus other pathogens as well. So we've had growers have really good success with bleach and Vercon. So it's more of a personal choice. Vercon's more expensive. It corrodes the tools a little less. Uh, bleach is cheap and you can get it in the, the store. They Like a 10% bleach solution. I forget the, off the top of my head what the Vercon suggested solution is, but both of those work really well. What we suggest for people to do is just, you know, if you're pruning on plants, get a, like a little bucket, put three pruners in there with your sanitizing agent, grab that first pruner, prune your first plant, stick it back in, grab the next one, and you know, so on down the line, by the time you get back to that first one, it's been in the sanitation solution for two or three minutes, and then you've really got a good chance of eliminating viroid that could have been on those pruners. Um, this is a question from Nat. Uh, Nat wants to know um, if he wanted to verify that his seeds that he produce are, are HPL VD free. Uh, is there any kind of like bulk or independent PCR testing that, that, that's available to, to, to kind of add certification to that? Hey, Nat, how's it going? Yeah, we can definitely work on that. And so traditionally, it's a good question because traditionally in agricultural settings, like when you buy you know, pepper seeds or watermelon seeds, they're, they're tested for the presence of a viroid for like one in 20,000 seeds or one, one seed in, you know, one pound of seeds. So there's, there's a way, you know, and we can do this in the lab. We don't have it set up yet, but we're more than willing to work with people to do that. And so what that would work is we need like a, a selection of the seed people have, and we'll just grind that up into a sample and then we'll do qPCR on it. And then, so we'll have a, a threshold detection. So like you will give, you know, whatever our target is, say, you know, it is not detectable at one in 20,000 seeds. And so I think this is what's gonna happen. And like, there's a lot of, like, if you look at traditional ag, the, there, these, some of these regulations are put in place for seed producers. So growers know what they're buying. And so they have it as part of the workflow to be, we test this batch of, batch of seeds and it, it did not surpass the threshold of one seed in 20,000 being. Uh, contaminated. So yeah, re reach out. We can we can work on that sort of test for sure. Great questions. Yeah, that's really I love the seed uh, involvement because I didn't ever really consider seed or it with HPLVD or in tissue culture setting. So that's really uh, exciting to hear that there's solutions uh, there. Um, I think. All the other questions um, were, were answered for the most part. We kind of had some that got answered through text. So uh, is there anything else um, that we missed? I mean, we want to ask any last questions because I think it, at this point I might pass it back over to Natalyn and, and thank our guests uh, for, for walking us through that amazing presentation. Thank you guys. Thank you, Daniel, and Max, and Jeremy, and all of you who are logged in and enjoying this panel. Um, just want to remind people that tomorrow's panel um, is gene editing with Venki and on Friday genetic storage for common access. I put links over in the chat feature for people to register. Um, we will again be broadcasting live on YouTube um, through Hendrix Farms uh, YouTube account. And um, probably sometime next week, we'll get all these videos online um, on either of our websites so that people can log back in and watch and see everything that you might have missed. Um, with that, I want to say thank you again and everybody have a great day.